there's a deep yearning within us for connectedness and cooperation and coming together and working together and feeling part of something, you know. And we need to find ways we can feed that in the human spirit because that's us at our best. You're listening to Dr. Paul Gilbert on Psychologists Off the Clock. We are four clinical psychologists here to bring you cutting edge and science-based ideas from psychology to help you flourish in your relationships, work, and health. I'm Dr. Debbie Sorensen, practicing in Mile High, Denver, Colorado. I'm Dr. Diana Hill, practicing in Seaside, Santa Barbara, California. From coast to coast, I'm Dr. Yael Schoenbrunn, a Boston-based clinical psychologist and assistant professor at Brown University. And from sunny San Diego, I'm Dr. Jill Stoddard, author of Be Mighty and the Big Book of Act Metaphors. We hope you take what you learn here to build a rich and meaningful life. Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. Mental health professionals, we want to remind you that we're sponsored by Praxis Continuing Education. You can really transform your practice and your life with the latest psychological theory and its application through Praxis. They offer online courses, both on-demand courses and courses that are live online. Some of the upcoming courses for the summer include ACT and Behavioral Analysis, a nine-week consultation course, Foundations of Compassion-Focused Therapy, Fundamentals of Dialectical Behavior Therapy, and Acceptance and Commitment Therapy with Parents. We have a coupon code for $50 off the live online courses on our website if you go to offtheclockpsych.com. Like many people across the country, we here at Psychologists Off the Clock have been distressed and outraged by the current and longstanding prejudice and violence against Black Americans. And we want to make a statement that we stand against racism and stand for racial justice. These past few weeks are symptoms of a long history of violence and oppression. And as psychologists, we are deeply concerned about the physical and mental health consequences of oppression and oppose racism. We have some resources for people who want to do more learning about this topic, which is really essential for everyone. We all have a part to play here that we'll link to on our webpage, some anti-racism resources, some resources on Black mental health and for other people of color as well, and also about talking to children about racism. So check out our website if, if you'd like to see some of those. Today, we have Dr. Paul Gilbert on the show, who is the founder of Compassion Focused Therapy. And we recorded this episode about a month ago. And man, a lot has happened and changed since then. Yet the concepts that he talks about in relationship to compassion are concepts that we can apply and need more than ever right now. Yeah, we were just talking about how we're right now feeling both charged up and depleted there's so much happening and we all have so much important work to be doing, meaningful work, whether it's racial justice, dealing with the pandemic and important work that we're doing in our lives, caring for our kids, whatever the case may be. I think having compassion both toward ourselves and for others can really sustain us over time because what we don't want is for everyone to get so depleted that we all just lose steam on doing what's what matters most in the world. Mm -hmm. So compassion being in compassion focused therapy, this flow, this three directional flow, uh, when we have compassion for others, it activates and opens up our brain in certain ways that we can do perspective taking, we can be open minded, we can think of new solutions and hear different solutions than our own. And when we have um, compassion for ourselves, we also can recharge and we can understand that we all make mistakes and we all have opportunities to, to shift and redirect again and keep on learning and growing. And then when we take in compassion, that also can help us recharge in our communities. So it really can be the key ingredient to sustaining what needs to be a long-term effort as well as riding the motivation wave that many of us have right now and taking action when that wave is high. Paul Gilbert is a professor of clinical psychology at the University of Derby and honorary visiting professor at the University of Queensland. He has researched evolutionary approaches to psychopathology with a special focus on mood, shame, and self-criticism and is the founder of Compassion Focused Therapy. Dr. Gilbert has written or edited 21 books and over 250 papers and book chapters. In 2006, he established the Compassionate Mind Foundation 
as an international charity with the mission statement to promote well-being through the scientific understanding of application of compassion. And you can find that at compassionateatmind.co.uk. In March 2011, he was awarded an OBE by the Queen for services to mental health. Dr. Gilbert is now the director of the Center for Compassion Research and Training at Derby University, UK. And we're very grateful to you to come on the show, taking your time to be with us. Thank you very much, Diane, for inviting me. That's a great, uh, that's a delight. Thank you so much. Yes. So last time we had you on, we talked a lot about your compassionate mind model and uh, we wanted to have you back on because I think your teachings are particularly relevant right now. My colleague, Debbie Sorensen, wrote me this little note saying um, that she had heard someone say, we're all in the same storm, but we're not all in the same boat. I'm wondering if you can talk about the flow of compassion, because I think what's really unique about your work is that you don't just focus on self-compassion or compassion for other, but it's really these three components of compassion for self, compassion for other, and the ability to receive compassion that I think we really need all, all of them right now. Yes. Yes. I mean, I think that's a very important point you make. I mean, we are in the same storm, but ultimately we are in the same boat because ultimately every one of us will die. Ultimately, every mm. one of us is in the cycle of impermanence and we will lose mm. people we love. Ultimately, nobody can escape the realities of uh, aging, decaying and dying. So we are, we are all there. How it happens in the course of our death, that's another matter, of course, because the virus is killing people and unexpectedly and too early, basically. So the issue of the, of the flows of compassion then is how compassion really is partly focused on this compassion for others. That's the key thing within the Buddhist tradition. But also um, the caring and sharing of others has, was extremely important in our hunter-gatherer uh, history. When we were hunter-gatherers, that's how we survived. We cared and shared for each other. We shared knowledge. We shared hunting. We shared food. You know, small groups, small groups of, of humans. And we has now realized that we built a brain. We evolved a brain over a number of millions of years, two, maybe three millions of years, which are very honed into caring and sharing. So caring and sharing is absolutely fundamental. And we feel at our best and we our immune systems, our cardiovascular systems, our, all kind, uh, our brain front cortex works best when we feel embedded in a caring and sharing network of people, as opposed to a selfish or critical or hostile or um, rejecting, neglectful group of people, then the brain, do, and brain and body doesn't work so well. But the brain works much better and our bodies work much better when we are in this context of caring and sharing. We feel cared for and we feel that we can make a contribution to others. So making a contribution to others is also very, very important. And there's quite a lot of research now showing that when we feel we can make a contribution to others, when we can be compassionate to others, that also has a very powerful impact on a number of physiological processes. So being cared for, receiving the care and, and help and support of others is really good for us physiologically, makes us feel good, but also being compassionate to others and being able to make a contribution and feeling you're doing something is important. And certainly in this country, and I think in yours too, what's been quite extraordinary and very heartwarming is the number of people who have volunteered to go out and try to be helpful as best they can. So tremendous desires to contribute, to help others. So those two things are very, very important. And sometimes, you know, when we get caught up in our own worlds, actually turning outwards, thinking, okay, well, one of the compassionate things that I need to do is to be aware of how helpful other people will be to me and also what I can do to help others. That can sometimes bounce us out of our tendency to be obsessed with ourselves. And then, of course, we have self-compassion, which we can talk about if you want. But those three cycles, that cycle of three, you know, compassion for others, openness to the compassion from others, and self-compassion, they form a nice little uh, connected network and um and that's very good for your body and your brain. <laughs> so I'd love to talk about what gets in the way of that, because you, when you said we get caught up in ourselves, you kind of put your hands over your face, like or this <laughs> narrowed vision. And what I see and what I've been seeing in my practice is, and even within my own self, is these experiences where 
you know, maybe someone in, in my practice is, is really struggling because they're trying to manage the kids at home and their work at home and their worries about, you know, groceries and, and all of those things. But then they criticize themselves for struggling because it doesn't compare to what the tragedy that other people are having. Or maybe a therapist that I am talking to is rolling, you know, she's rolling her eyes at the, the senior who's missing out on her prom, who's spending a whole session about how she's so upset that prom is not happening. And she's having a hard time having compassion for her, her client. So I'm wondering what, what gets in the way of us being compassionate towards ourselves and, 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 and towards others, or maybe minimizing people's experiences. Okay. So we'll take the first one, which is yeah. compassion for self, right? So the point that you make is a very good one that people sometimes compare, you know, or, mm. you know, compared to the problems of other people, you know, compared to people's in the shanty towns of South America or Af Africa or whatever, my life is great, you know? So, okay, I'm locked down for a little bit, but you know, the problem with that is that, Yes, it makes a lot of sense, but it doesn't work. I mean, the thing is, if you've got a broken leg, it really doesn't help you to know that somebody else has got two broken legs and a broken elbow. I, I'm sorry about that, but it doesn't actually take my pain away, right? So these are these are important issues. But when we are struggling within our own domain, then we actually have to find ways of dealing with the stress in our own domain. If we start comparing ourselves, then we do what we call invalidation we start invalidating what we feel rather than working what we feel we're sort of saying well we shouldn't really be feeling this because because and once you do that then you're into trying to suppress your feelings rather than work with them so the first thing then is be careful of social comparison because it's about validating what you are experiencing noticing what you're experiencing and working with your experience so the example you gave of somebody who's trying to balance working with the children, maybe trying to help them at home, maybe trying to keep their job going over the internet uh, uh, in a small crowded place. The, what you will be feeling is perfectly natural, uh, a set of stresses. You might be getting frustrated easily. You might be getting angry easily. You might be getting anxious easily. You might just sometimes put your head in your hands and just cry. And, you know, people say, I just sitting on the bed and just cry and cry because just I feel overwhelmed by it all. The first thing is to recognize that we are in extraordinarily stressful, frightening uh, circumstances. Not only are we worried about the virus, but we're worried about what the virus might be doing to our jobs. And we are trapped. You know, my, one of my research um, areas uh, over 20 years was the study of entrapment and the ways in which people felt trapped in relationships or trapped in jobs they couldn't get out of or whatever it was. And being physically trapped in the way that we are is an incredibly stressful thing for humans because humans are basically hunter-gatherers. We should be out and about. Our kids are extremely stressed by being confined in these small spaces. So this is grossly abnormal living that we're going through. So unfortunately, through no fault of your own, you will be experiencing very strong emotions because your brain will be acting, wanting to get out. Your brain will be telling you, you're trapped. You've got to get out. You've got to do this. You've got to move, you know. So understanding the psychology of entrapment is very important. Understanding not comparing yourself with others, because that is going to be very helpful. Validating your emotions, because they will be quite intense through no fault of your own. So learning how to be with these very powerful emotions in a way that's compassionate, accepting, allowing. Uh, th this is uh, one of the steps towards helping you with these powerful emotions that, that they will be powerful and that's absolutely not your fault and there's nothing abnormal about you you're not going crazy it's just unfortunate that you are in a very 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 difficult stressful situation and uh, or, or we, you know we just have to find the ways of managing it rather than sort of fighting with those emotions i feel like i could record that little section of you and play it to myself every night. And it would feel really good to hear because the combination of it, it's not your fault. And, um, and that this is hard is really helpful. Yeah. It's really yeah. helpful. Yeah. I mean, if you fall over and break a leg, I mean, it's not really your fault that you have pain and therefore if you need to walk on it, it's going to hurt you. Because mm -hmm. you'd just understand that, wouldn't you? You know, you would say, oh, um, you know, I shouldn't be feeling the pain in my leg. Well, normally I don't feel the pain. Well, yeah, but you... <laughs> so the point is that these are extremely unnatural, very unnatural ways for humans to live. 
you know that's why we put people in prison because it's a punishment right so these entra- these entrapped positions are themselves causing us a huge amount of stress and then in, you not only are you trapped but for some people they're trapped in and they're very lonely they don't have any you know the, the high levels of loneliness which is even worse and for other people coping with children and so forth in these confined spaces where they themselves the children themselves are highly stressed is very very difficult so the first thing is not your fault not your fault at all uh, and you will you know you'll try to suppress it but it'll be tricky you will have very strong emotions so the most important thing is when you get them try as best you can to you know do your breathing ground your body as best you can remind yourself is absolutely not your fault it's very very tough what you're going through and just try and do the best you can in that moment to be with the emotion but not act it in a way that's you know harmful to you or to others and the other thing is i think that helps us sometimes is to keep in mind on the future that you will get out again and think of all the things you're going to appreciate that perhaps you didn't before this, but it just makes you realize how much we take for granted. Yeah. Never even think about it. You know, Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Just, just don't think about it. Go Mm-mm. to cricket matches or sports matches, roll up at airports, jump on airplanes. I mean, mm-hmm. Just never think about it, really. Never think about it. Until you can't it. do it anymore. And then you suddenly yeah. realize, oh, my gosh. You know, yeah. It, it reminds me of that feeling of you go out and backpacking in that first shower. When you come back, you're like, oh, it's the best shower in the world. It has that same, you don't know it until you don't do it. Until yeah. You miss it. So holding on to these, this future, I think, is also extremely important and helpful because otherwise mm-hmm. it can just seem, oh. <laughs> so that's the, the capacity of the new brain that you've talked about in our previous episode. You talked about the old brain and the new brain. And the new brain has this capacity to do things like fantasize or generate yeah. hope or even harness some of the, you know, kind of contain some of the old brain's um, impulses a bit. And the second part of it's not your fault that you've that you've talked about is that it's not your fault, but it is your responsibility. Yeah, yeah. And I, I, I really liked this um, article that Yuval Noah Harari wrote in Time Magazine, and it was shared on your Compassionate Mind listserv. And in it, he wrote, he wrote that many blame the coronavirus epidemic on globalization and say the only way to prevent such outbreaks is to deglobalize the world. But he says just the opposite. The real antidote to epidemic is not segregation, but rather cooperation. Exactly. Exactly. And that really points to your work of, of, yeah. of our responsibility to cooperate. And when we're in the compassionate, kind mind space, we do a better job at yeah. cooperating with each other. Can you speak a bit to that? Yes, absolutely right. That's extremely, that's such an important point that we are an interconnected species now. Okay, and uh, we do have a tendency to, you know, form tribes and small groups and, you know, whether it's a football team or whether it's nations and so on, to make these distinctions and boundaries around us. Uh, And that's okay to a degree, but the most important thing when it comes to health and when it comes to suffering, when it comes to suffering, we need to really think of ourselves as interconnected. And as Harari says, it's our abilities to cooperate. So, People now are working around the world to try and find a vaccine. And this is a highly cooperative. All the labs, as far as I know, are cooperating and pulling their, their data. Um, so that's the only way we're going to kind of really defeat this virus is to eventually, like smallpox, I'm afraid, get a vaccine. Um, and then we will defeat it and get rid of it. So, but that's, that's medical science. And that's a highly cooperative uh, in, in endeavor. We're also cooperating in small ways when you talk about uh, maybe how things will change for us or reflecting on um, the hope that we have. Even I just think about my little community of we set up a place for the farmers to bring their farm boxes. My neighbors all come out in a social distance way and they pick up their little farm box. And it's this way that we're learning to cooperate in a a different way. The farmer gets to sell their food and we get food brought to our house in in a safe way. There's these small little examples of cooperation that I think bring us a lot of joy that we may want to continue on after this. We're figuring out uh, new ways of being with each other, new positive ways. I think there's there's a terrific examples, Diane. They're terrific examples. Yes, absolutely. Brilliant. Um, so, yes, I think that's wonderful about how we 
many people have a yearning, actually. What we begin to realize that although, you know, the neoliberal agenda is to compete and just focus on yourself and become as rich as you can, actually, actually, what's in us is a deep yearning for connectedness, a deep yearning for sharing, deep pleasure. Because the way you talk about it, you talk about the real pleasure of seeing people doing this and isn't it amazing and we're trying to do that and trying to make that work. There's a deep yearning within us for connectedness and cooperation and coming together and working together and feeling part of something, you know. And we need to find ways we can feed that in the human spirit because that's us at our best. Um, so after this has passed, which hopefully will be as soon as possible, <laughs> um, there are real questions about will we just gradually slip back into our own individualistic worlds or will we find some way in which we can harness this deep yearning for connectedness that we've sort of lost in the West, really? I've heard a lot in my practice of, of clients who talk about, now a pandemic is not a way to necessarily experience a slowdown, but talking about the, the appreciation of slowing down because of how busy they were and how caught up they were in this competitive uh, world of running around trying to make more money or have their kids involved in more things. And it was interesting when I was looking back over the compassionate mind, you mentioned this like over a decade ago, you said, quote, our lifestyles are spiritually, mentally, and physically exhausting us, and we know it. And there's this wake up call that I think people are having of when they're when now they're with their families more and they're engaging in what really matters in terms of helping people or health or our elders, that there's sort of a bit of a, a shift and it's a different uh, way of being for a lot of people moving out of competition. I think what you, the, the point that you made there is really, really important that people discover this. Mm. The thing that all of us are struggling with is that we know that sake like going to the gym we know that people will say oh this is great go to the gym i feel good blah 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 blah. they do it for a couple of months and then they maybe don't go quite so often and then and then within a year they're not doing it anymore so one of the things that's interesting to you know people like yourself and myself who are interested in compassion is how do you maintain it because the the world will try and pull you back we'll try and pull you back into the shadows again so gradually gradually we slip back into the you know the competitive rat race a little bit you know it's going to so how do we prevent that now, i think that's a question all of us need to think about because we know from many other behavioral change regimes whether it's getting fit or gain on diets or whatever it is they work for a while but then when the pressures go they people slip back <laughs> Can you talk about your three systems model and how that maps on to these components of cooperation, maybe our threat systems, and also this drive to compete? We know that there are many ways in which we can think about our emotions. There are many different types of emotions. But one of the ways we're thinking about emotions is just to think about what did they evolve to do? Why, why did they evolve in the way that they do? And in the uh, compassion focused approach okay and again, again i didn't make this up this is in the science we suggest there are three di different dimensions now there's always been two positive and negative effect but we've added a third because of what the science was telling us so one set of emotions are really there to activate your body for you to take actions if you're threatened and depending on the kind of threat it is you will either experience anger and you'll want to fight defend yourself or it'll be anxiety and you'll want to run away and get away or whatever. So the fight-flight system is very much part of your threat system. Your threat system then is primarily an activating system to engage you in behaviors that will protect you and defend you. That's how it's evolved. The sl slight problem we've got as humans, however, is that we can keep that system stimulated by what we think. So that system works pretty well for most animals because what's going to threaten them is in the environment. So it's a lion or something like that. And once they run away from the lion, then that's it. They, they're not, nothing's going to stimulate their threat system anymore. But for humans, we can constantly stimulate it by worrying and thinking. You know, So if we got away from the lion, we can think, yeah, but what about tomorrow? So we can do all this kind of thinking, which maintains us in threat, 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 threat. Was, 
retaining the threat of arousal. So the way in which we regulate our uh, ways in which we pay attention to threat, the ways we focus on threat, the ways we think about threat, the way we anticipate threat, the way we ruminate on threat, all of that is very important for how that system is working. So that's the threat system. And there's something also about, I think, with that system in terms of modern technology is activating some of that system as well. I know in the beginning of the, when the pandemic was really hitting the US, I was checking my phone, I don't know, more than 20 times a day. And my threat system was getting activated over and over and over again. Once I reduced my news consumption to twice a day, it actually helped a lot in terms of me not going into that threat space all day long, which isn't healthy for me. I was having a hard time caring for my kids. I was blowing up at them. I was not not in a healthy space. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good point you make because your threat system has the fight flight system. So they're both is part of the threat system. So if if that system is overstimulated, then not only can we be on a short fuse for the flight, the anxiety, but we can be on a short fuse for the fight, the anger. So the both the 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 ease of activation goes up because your threat system, the whole threat system is, right. you know, rearing away. Or and freeze. That, that Dr. Porges also talks about freezing, which is, I think, another one that we tend to do. Yeah. Yes, we can also mm-hmm. freeze. And we ha- also have inhibitory defenses, which is where you get into depression and you just close down. When the mm-hmm. system gets exhausted and the fight and flight aren't working, then you can go into depressed states and you just sort of have these collapses. So. So this is um, <clears throat> very, very, very important. And uh, I think the point you make about the media is very worrying, actually, because some of the media are doing brilliant. There's some fantastic articles in the media. But what the media tends to do is to sensationalize. So they're constantly stimulating upset in you, upset in you all the time. We've now got a media who's just feeding us threat, 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 threat. Not only are you coping with the environment itself, not only are you coping with being trapped in your house, not only are you coping with all the fears of the virus, but you're also coping with the media that's constantly stimulating your threat system and your grief system. Because, you know, I read these stories and, you know, they make you cry, don't they, really? They're, oh, my goodness. Mm-hmm. So, but it, and it's just overwhelming. It's just overloading. So you have to recognize to do exactly what you did to say, okay, look, yeah, there is a lot of suffering out there and people are dying. But if I keep engaging with it like that, I'm just going to be overwhelmed and get burnt out. The next thing then is coming to the other issues about how can you use the positive emotional systems to be helpful to you. And uh, there we say there are two. And again, this isn't me. This is in the literature. Me in the literature. One is an activating positive emotion that's associated with excitement and joy and imagining the, the future and taking pleasure from your kids and doing things that are enjoyable. Uh, and the other one is what we call the soothing system, which is linked to rest and digest. And that system is very important because that links to a different type of physiology, uh, a deceleration of the threat system, a, a calming of the drive system, the taking, you know, allowing the mind and the body to settle. That's why it's called rest and digest. And there are various things you can do in order to do that. One is exactly as you said, is just be aware of what is stimulating your threat system unhelpfully. Because if your threat system can be stimulated helpfully, okay, and you, you need to pay attention to threat, then okay, that's important. But a lot of what we're experiencing is unhelpful, unhelpful threat stimulation because we can't do anything about it and it just makes us feel bad. So the second thing then is learning how to pay attention to things that soothe you, that ground you, that calm you, and practicing bringing your mind to those things. It might be breathing, it might be listening to music, it might be meditating on music, it might be sitting listening to the sound of the sea. I mean whatever works for you, but finding things that allows your attention to focus on themes that you find settling, help settle the body rather than stirring up the body. And th- that takes a little bit of practice. Sometimes it could be painting or if you play an instrument, getting lost in playing an instrument or piano or guitar or whatever it is, but finding something where your mind can be focused on something that's non-threatening to you it gives you a sense of enjoyment maybe but also a sense of calming is there a place where the drive and that contentment soothing systems kind of work together 
Yeah. Because one of the things that actually has been more helpful for me than taking bubble baths right now has been ways in which I feel like I'm I'm helping. Yes. And and I'm actually I'm doing something that's active. I feel like I need to do something active, but that's also helping in some way. And even just reframing for our household the words of the we're under lockdown and, and shifting it to we're not under lockdown. We're choosing to stay at home to protect people. We're protecting people by staying at home. It shifted in my mind. Um, it's, it felt like a shift in that three systems model that I went from threat to more of a soothing and or drive place. Yes, yeah, so I think yeah. that's a brilliant point you make, isn't it? Because that's what we were talking about earlier, finding something where you can make a contribution uh, that has yeah. a really powerful impact on the organization of your body and your mind. Yes, absolutely. So the soothing system and the, and the, and the drive system can certainly work together when we feel s- safe to be able to do things. Play, when we play, for example, when we're having play with people, we're having fun with people, we're both excited, but also we feel safe and contented, see? So I think the point you're making is an extremely important one, uh, that sometimes what helps the threat system is to be doing something, or settles the threat system, is to be doing something where we feel we can make a contribution, because that gives us a different kinds of different kind of positive affect different kind of positive emotion can we talk about something that is my one of the things that activates my threat system is our children and the impact of uh this pandemic i think there's the the impact on obviously health and concern about safety there's also the long-term impact on the psychology of our children and as you talk about play and how my little seven-year-old can't play in the same way that he used to be able to play with his friends and may not be able to for a long time. I'm curious about the impact long-term of this social distancing on our kids. Well, it could have a very positive impact. When we think about trauma, remember, what we're thinking about trauma are things that threaten the child, like the parent is aggressive or abusive or neglectful. This isn't this, isn't this kind of trauma, right? kind of trouble we're talking about is the experience of not being able to do what I want to do, but in the context, like I'm sure with you, in the context of a very loving family. So what is happening here in these contexts, um, if, if, you know, not so much when, when there's a lot of strife and stress and the family is slipping, but in these contexts, children are actually learning to be very attentive to the needs of others. They're learning that the world can be a frightening place. They're learning that we need to help each other and they're learning that you know we are making sacrifices for the benefit of others. We're learning that we're giving up playing in order to be helpful to others. So yes, it's upsetting and difficult, but it's not a trauma in the sense that the child is frightened or feels mm-hmm. in an unsafe environment or um or whatever. So it's a reaching out kind of trauma. It's a it's a grieving kind of trauma more than a sort of fear based kind of trauma. And sometimes my we don't have any data on this as far as I know. Um, but actually it can make children more empathic actually in the long run. So it's unpleasant, but it can make children more empathic. And sometimes you see this, you know, in kids who have grown up with in families where somebody has been ill or whatever it does it can make children quite em- empathic to the needs of others. I don't know if there's any research going on on that. The trauma we're, we're worried about is where families are becoming very aggressive and they're taking their frustrations out on the kids and that sort of thing over the long term. You know, occasional is okay, but over the long term. So the child is growing up in this tense environment day in, day out. That's a worry. That's a mm-hmm. serious worry for these children. Um, so it's more the threat system of the parent that we should be worried about, the alcohol yeah. use going up, the domestic so. violence going up, and then that transmitting to the yeah. to the child. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. see, the more you validate your child, say, yes, look, this is sad and isn't it important, but also think about how wonderful what you're doing, you know, doing this and you're realizing the sadness and that life can be like this. And this is what we do. We try to help other people. And sometimes it makes us feel bad and sad because we have to give up things. We have to lose things. But that's and helping your child realize, but that's actually quite a wonderful thing you're doing. Mm-hmm. Um, so you, you're positively valuing their sacrifice, which is very different from um, traumatizing. <laughs> that's 
that's a different that's a different game altogether, right? So you're not traumatizing them with threat. You're helping them come to terms with what's actually for, for the child a frustrating and very sad situation, but they're not um, frightened. I don't think if they're frightened of the virus, and that's another thing that we can help them with, helping them to understand that actually um, kids are pretty much invulnerable. Not completely, not completely, but pretty much. Uh, and just help them understand the science, a little bit about the science. I was going to say, it's been an incredible science <laughs> explanation of viruses because of of some of the most fascinating uh, things to study are viruses. They're, yeah, yeah, yeah. they're it's, quite it's, sneaky, aren't they? They come and take over our cells the way they do. Well, yeah, viruses have been around since, you know, because they're bits of DNA, so they've been around since the beginnings of life. And in fact, viruses are often what causes damage to DNA, which causes mutation, which causes evolution so viruses have played a very major part in evolution in fact a lot of your dna is junk because it's virus dna that's got in and doesn't Mm -hmm. do anything so if you put it into google junk virus dna in the human genome you'll find it's extremely interesting it was like seven percent virus or something right DNA. it's fascinating (laughs) yeah Yeah. So what we what we need to be activating our our uh, fight system for and our drive is in fighting that virus rather than fighting each other. Exactly. Now the other thing is I'm kind of interested in. Uh, I don't know what you're taking it is on this, but the you know in the medical profession they've been very keen on getting PPE, you know, uh, personal protective equipment, all that stuff to stop the virus getting in. But what they haven't been paying attention to, and I can't quite understand it, is what state is that person in? if the virus does get in. Yeah. So we've got a lot of our medical staff working 12-hour shifts, right? High levels of stress. Their cortisol is going to be through the roof. We know cortisol has a massive impact on the immune system. We suspect, we don't know, that they're probably not in the most immune, strong or competent position. So I would also be thinking about what I am thinking about, I am thinking about, is how can I strengthen my immune system? So should I get it, then I make sure my immune system is in as a robust way as it can be. So try and take a little exercise in the house, try and be careful with my diet. I'm a little bit of a supplement person because I believe in that, but I can't obviously suggest that because I'm not a qualified. That's just a personal view. But one of the things we could be doing as well is just finding out a little bit about how does the immune system work and doing things like meditations, we know that can help the immune system. Compassion training can help the immune system. Anything I can do to give myself a little bit of an advantage, then I'm going to do that. So should I get sick, then I've got an immune system that's likely to deal with it. Well, as I just stress myself, stress myself, stress myself, probably isn't going to do my immune system a lot of good. <laughs> right. And if you do get sick, it's also not your fault because you didn't do a good enough job at your immune system building. So we have to be careful about that. The critic will get in any way, right? Uh, even healthy people get sick and die from coronavirus. Yeah, absolutely. But that's, yes. That's a wonderful yes. point. Yeah. Thank you so yeah. much. Brilliant, brilliant point. Yeah. But the other yeah. thing is to also remember that, you know, to focus on the fact that should you get ill, there are these amazing people in our hospitals and wherever who are, some of them are risking their lives because they're just doing these 12-hour shifts. I mean, they're working themselves into the ground, which I don't think is necessarily a good thing, but people will be there to help you. You know, so what I think is, you know, if I think of some of the medical staff that have died, it kind of makes you cry, really, because you think, well, if I got sick, these people would be there doing everything they could to save me. And moving my mind into focusing on, these amazing people there will do everything they can to save me. So it takes me out of my own personal fear into, but I'm in a world where all these people will do everything they can to save me. That really changes how I feel about this virus. It makes me think of some of your work on archetypes and the heroes, the archetype yeah. of, of the heroes that are out there and how even Steve Hayes did a writing on this about how we can cultivate our own hero within Yes, and then also appreciate the heroes that are, amongst us during this time yes. yeah yes extraordinary and this this real feeling of i mean i think part i think it has changed a little bit for me because i would have said six months ago the feeling that we're you know with some of our leaders were really moving into a world that's just becoming more and more selfish the rich are getting richer and you know we have a lot of these rich people are still doing fossil fuels and plastics and blah 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 but actually, and 
this is slightly changed in the sense of recognizing that there's also a huge, huge swell of individuals who want to create the good, who are not self-focused, but want to create the good. And the, the questions that all of us have to ask as therapists and psychologists is, how do we tap into this? How do we tap into the reality that you know, so many of us actually want to work for the common good, not for the common selfish side, but for the common good, and how not to get attracted to the dark side, you know, with tax cuts or whatever it is. Uh, so we support our services. We, you know, we we think about the, how we can work for the benefit of others. So I think it's a great challenge for us at this point. Yes. So in in closing, I'm wondering if there's just any messaging that you think would be helpful for us to keep our our hearts and our mind on that of working for the good of others. Yeah, so I think the key thing then is firstly recognizing the extraordinary stresses that we are under, all right? There's the fear of the virus itself. There's the fear of what's going to happen to the economy. People might be frightened of their own jobs. And then there's the whole psychology of confinement and containment. So just give ourselves a break. We are going to be feeling pretty tense and difficult at times. And so if that side of us gets the better of us, all we can do is as best we can to kind of try to regulate our behavior as best we can, but don't start criticizing and bashing yourself on the head because that'll only make you feel much worse and it'll make it much more likely that you'll get, you know, stressed again. So, you know, really validate your experience, understand why you're having the experiences that you're having, try and treat those experiences with compassion, understanding as best you can. Then the second thing is to recognize, try as best you can to realize what the threat is. And we it's so difficult to realize what the threat is from all the numbers flying around. But I mean, as you were saying, Diane, mostly of what we're doing is closing down to protect others, not so much ourselves, but it's to protect others. Because for most of us, not for all of us, but for most of us, um, if we got the virus, we would recover. And some people have had it and they didn't even know they had it. So this is important. We are closing down mostly, mostly to protect others. So focus on that reason, not the fear to the self, but that reason for the close down. Focusing on we're making sacrifice for the benefit of others. And then also, should you get ill, focus on the fact that there are many people out there who will, who will you know, go, go the last mile to protect you and help you and get you well again. So hold on to this fact that this is a movement that's helping us realize that although it's very easy to be cynical about humans because we humans can do terrible things this is an example where we're actually starting to stand up to the plate we are showing that we do have this other side and that is something which is terrific tremendous wonderful and all of us now have to work out how we're going to hang on to this in the months and years ahead how are we going to live to the best in us, not the worst in us? And that's a challenge for all of us. Yes. Well, thank you, Dr. Gilbert. And for those of you that want to continue to build these capacities for compassion, I think that a great place to start is with your book, The Compassionate Mind. And for those that want to look more into the history of compassion and our tricky brains, um, Living Like Crazy is another good one to read. I would just say that if you go onto our website, which you mentioned at the beginning, there are lots and lots of practices and exercises that you can download for free and you can try them out. So you'll hear me going on and on about how to breathe. And yes. stuff. They're all free. Just go and listen to them and if they're helpful to you. And do your own research as well. Learning certain breathing techniques will help to regulate your body and your sympathetic uh, and parasympathetic nervous system. Learning how to breathe, learning postures, learning visualizations, learning how to use, use music with your meditations, finding meditation music. And there's lots and lots of these out there on the, on the internet. Go and have a look and just make it your out of an interest of finding ways that you feel you can help ground yourself and settle your mind, okay? Find your own way. There's lots out there. Uh, and as I say, if you're interested in the compassionate stuff, then go and have a look at the Compassion Mind Foundation website. Great. Wonderful. Thank you again for coming on today. We appreciate all your wisdom and work. 
My pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. We'll see you in a couple of years. <laughs> Thank you for listening to Psychologists Off the Clock. If you enjoy our podcast, you can help us out by leaving a review or contributing on Patreon. You can find us wherever you get your podcasts, and you can connect with us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We'd like to thank our interns, Dr. Catherine Foley-Saldania and Dr. Katie Lear. This podcast is for informational and entertainment purposes only and is not meant to be a substitute for mental health treatment. If you're having a mental health emergency, dial 911. If you're looking for mental health treatment, please visit the resources page of offtheclockpsych.com.